so we're going to get going again today. And uh, our, our next speaker is uh, Sean Guest, CEO of Valura. Now, Sean, uh, he's got a big case of deja vu here because he had his investor day in this very room yesterday. And I came by and I, I saw all the people here and I saw this set up. And I just told the hotel, I says, just leave everything. Don't do anything. This is a great setup. Don't, don't switch it. So otherwise, you wouldn't have got any pens or papers or anything. You would have just had chairs. So uh, Sean did us a favor there. He made sure that we got all this stuff. So uh, Sean, uh, look forward to hearing all about this massive new discovery, where it's going. And uh, please. Like he said, it's a pleasure to be here again. Um, so uh, probably a bit of a sh different shift here. We're going to go into Turkey on the other side of the world there and talk a bit about what Velour has been doing. Tur Velour has been in Turkey now for uh, oh, about seven or eight years. And that, but uh, recently there's been a big discovery and it's really what I want to give you guys today is a context of really where we're sitting with that discovery. We've had a huge jump in the share price but where do we see it going and trying to give you the right background to kind of make the call on where we're at and what is the potential to really realize this value that we have here in Turkey. As you probably see, uh, the disclaimers, I'm standing from the lawyers there. But I'm going to step back and say it was just over a year ago in Q1 2017, Valura concluded a series of transactions. Now, at that point, Valura was really operating just in western Turkey, up in the Thrace Basin, about an hour from Istanbul. And at the top point, we took out the operator who was transatlantic at that time. We'd been involved, but they were operating a lot of the acreage. And what that gave us was almost 100% interest across the lands that we had in, there, in that area. So that was production, gas production that we had. But as well, we believe there was potential for this unconventional data, uh, this unconventional play based on the information we had. And in that same month, we also then did a deal with Statoil. Now, they bought into the acreage position to get 50% working interest. The cash they provided actually bought uh, uh, Transatlantic. And then they came in only into the deep rights for 50%. And more importantly, as part of that deal, they also agreed to fund a work program that was going to test this unconventional play. Right, so they were going to provide two deep wells, drilled, frack, tested, as well as infill seismic across the area. And that was Q1. By Q2, we'd already spotted the first deep well out there, which was called Yamalik 1. That finished drilling in July, and we announced the results to uh, very little interest. Um, but we in Statoil knew what we had at the time and how exciting that was. And it wasn't until in December when we started fracking and testing that well and really the results we saw exceeded our expectations from the flow rate and how much gas we got out as well as the condensate. And that was what really created the excitement in the story and the excitement in Valura. So based on that, we were the top performing oil and gas stock on the Toronto Stock Exchange last year. We're up about 350%. But if you look at the past six months and going from October through to where we've come through that raise, we've actually come up about 10 times. So we were trading at about 45 cents. Um, in October, and now we're averaging around 450 plus or minus a little bit on that as we go forward. So a very exciting time period, and as I kind of went around talking to people about this in Q1, the general comment I heard was, well, I've missed it, or, um, you know, thank you very much, that was brilliant, so what are you going to do for me this year, <laughs> right? And uh, what I want to show you is we do have a world what can be a world-class discovery here. We have huge volumes of gas that are in place. We still need to demonstrate the quality of the flow and the level of commerciality of this. We have a world-class uh, partner in Statoil, now Equinor is referred to them there. We have major import and export pipelines, tens of kilometers either side of this area. We get over $7 price for the gas, and we have some very good globally competitive fiscal terms. So it can be an extremely good project. Now, as we look forward, as we said, what are we going to do? Is there still that value bump looking forward? We're going into an appraisal program uh, with our partner, Equinor, that will start in Q3 this year. We're fully funded on that. We plan to drill three wells up to 5,000 meters deep that will be fracked and tested as well as we're going back to the one well that we drilled, the Amalek one that was a discovery, 
and we'll, tie that, we'll first tie that in, clean out all the plugs and look at the flow from that. So that's what we see. Taking it from what is viewed as a single well discovery forward to a commercial project is what can give that value bump in the company again. So you've got an international management team. I've only worked internationally my whole career, lived in Libya, Egypt, uh, Europe, um, Australia, Indonesia, through different companies, a lot with the majors. Um, and as well, we've got a board that's had an experience of both growing and selling companies internationally. We're experienced in how to work in these different jurisdictions, how you have to work with the locals, having quality local staff <coughs> on your company. And we believe we can not only deliver the value through the appraisal program, but deliver the value back to the shareholders. Okay, as I go through today, I'm just going to have a few slides really setting the context on Turkey, and obviously you may have some questions on Turkey, and then I'll go into what is the play that we've found and the way forward. So the snapshot, we do actually have conventional gas production that we um, have been producing there since we took over from Transatlantic. We grew that production every quarter last year, but that is not where the value in the company is currently lying. So we have that reserves there. We're positive cash flow at this point in time, but our focus is really on progressing and delivering on the deep play, the unconventional play. On the financials, no debt. The company has never had any debt, um, and we're well cashed up to deliver this program. You can see the gas price and the net backs that we currently get in Turkey. The key point I'll make on the capital structure is it's very simple. We don't have any PREF shares. We don't have any warrants, anything that's special, no anti-dilutes, anything like that. It's common shares that exist there, and the only thing that we have additionally on top of that is just really the options plan. The share prices I've noted there was from last Friday. Um, it does move around. Uh, there is a lot of liqui liquidity in the company. We have a liquidity equivalent about to Vermilion, and sometime about five times Suncor at this moment. So while it is still a relatively small stock, there is a lot of interest in trading in the company, so you can move in and out of it fairly quickly, and I think the share price today was up at about 470, so it's come off about 10% in the past few days. Okay, and just where you can see again, I'll just make that point that we're only working in the northwest of Turkey, the European part of Turkey. It's a very stable area, it's a very secular area, and we've been operating and working there for years. So when we look at Turkey, now one of the key things to Turkey is it's had some of the strongest economic growth in the G20 in the European com uh, community for a number of years. So looking at the GDP growth in that chart, and the other curve on there is actually the gas consumption in red. And the gas consumption is now, it's just under five and a half BCF a day, but last year it grew 20%. And this is a country where they recognize energy drives your economy and grows your economy. Gas is their main source they're using to drive the electricity growth and that, and they continue to expand on that. The only nervousness that Turkey actually feel is that they're more than 50% dependent on Russian gas, and they would obviously like to diversify that. The key point also, Turkey is importing uh, all that gas. So we do produce a little bit of gas in Turkey, but more than 99% is imported. Um, so as, as I was mentioning, they really, they would like to get away from that Russian uh, reliance. And the other strategy the country has is they want to be an energy hub. So they are building major pipelines at, as we speak right now, sometimes hard to believe here in Canada, but yes, it is possible, um, to import a lot more gas than they actually intend to consume. They want to be in between the suppliers of gas, which is Russia, the Middle East, uh, the Near East and Azerbaijan and that, and the European consumers, and they recognize a value in that. So with that demand for gas and with the limited gas they've had, we have very good fiscal terms. It's simple, 12.5% royalty and 22% corporate tax. And then um, the other point is we have very strong gas prices. The price is set by Botas, who own all the, op the infrastructure to move the gas around, which is a state-owned enterprise. But if you plot the price out, they make adjustments in that price to account for changes in exchange rate and to account for exchange, uh, changes in gas price. So if you look at the price, it tracks the EU gas price at that. And that's what we're seeing more and more now. They're making more adjustments to that price to keep it in line with the EU gas price. 
And the last point just is, it is a very mature service sector. They've had an oil and gas industry for decades. It has just been relatively small. This is showing a zoom in of our land and where we're at. Uh, so about half a million acres that we have um, in there. The major, the red lines to the north are the main import lines from Russia. They do about one and a half BCF a day. The blue line on the south is the new TANIP line that it will then connect to TAP, Trans-Adriatic, that's moving gas from Azerbaijan into Europe. It'll be commissioned and running later this year at about one and a half BCF a day, but it's designed to go to three BCF a day. So you've got potential for a new project sitting in between major import lines into a domestic market that needs your gas, as well as the ability to export that gas into a European market. The other point I'll note here is that we currently, um, we own and operate all the local <laughs> gas gathering infrastructure. So we have everything from wellhead through plant, compression, export lines to about 55 or 60 different customers. We can use all of that infrastructure to explore and appraise for this deep play. We can tie it in so the moment you drill a new well or you do a pilot project, that can immediately be sold onto your clients. And then I made the point of we've got major lines either side of us for the growth of this project. One other point I'll just make to emphasize this is to how important this gas is to Turkey is that there was an announcement last month of a Qatari group teaming up with a, a Turkish group to invest 5.2 billion US into a petrochemical plant which they intend to build right in the area that we're working. They haven't laid it out specifically yet, but they're looking at that type of investment into petrochemicals. And, an oil and gas guy, I kind of think of, well, okay, it's all about the gas or the oil that we're delivering to people, but no, the value that can come from the other streams, the value streams here and in the petrochemicals is huge. And in addition to doing the petrochemical plant, they're also going to build in the Thrace area where we operate um, a gas powered electricity generation where they're looking at about another 1.2 billion investment into that. So that's the type of investment that's dropping into this area that needs the feedstock that we may have through this project. Okay. So the background on Turkey, and really stepping forward to now is to, to what is it that we've got here when we talk about a basin center gas accumulation. Um, the first point is, this is really, it's nothing new. You guys you know, understand North America. These plays are existing all around North America. They're doing about four DC, uh, TCF a year of production out of basin center gas plays. It is an unconventional play. We're not talking shale though, we're talking reservoir rock. And essentially what happens is as you bury that rock deeper, the permeability, the ability to flow the hydrocarbons decreases and all of a sudden your gas can't get out. Now as you continue to bury that deeper, you're generating more gas in place, which can't escape so the pressure goes up and you get this high pressure gas trapped down in the center of the basin that normally it would flow out to the sides and to surface, but here it's actually trapped down in the play. The advantage of it being an unconventional play, as long as you've got the rock and you've got the gas, it's pervasive and there's lots of it in place. The disadvantage, as you know, is cost. It's all about how you actually develop it, horizontals, fracking, and that. So with Valura's operation in the shallow production, they recognized they were seeing this high pressure as you moved into the basin. And with recognizing that, thought the guys uh, who are Canadian recognized that this looked like a basin center gas play. So they acquired more data on it just by kind of poor boying it as they drilled a shallow well to try and deepen a bit. And then started to pick up the land position. Um, and recognizing it was there, then took it on the road and managed to find interest from Stad Oil. There were other parties bidding at the time but Statoil had the best bid to come in and then buy into the project as well as fund the exploration of this play. And the well that was drilled was the Amalek. And you can see there the basin and how we're down in the center of it. Um, the other wells were existing at the time and both of those encountered high pressure gas at depth, but with at that time you weren't looking really for an unconventional play, so it was inconclusive, the results you had. But high pressure gas was definitely there and flowed to surface. But Yamalik at about 2,500 meters, the pressure started to build up and it continued to build as we drilled about 1,300 meters of section. And that is something that's a bit different than most of the plays in North America. Most of them, you actually get a hydraulic sink where the pressure will go back to normal. We haven't seen that. 
the gas pressure and the saturation in the rock just keeps building as you go deeper. And we finally had to stop at 4,200 meters because we'd reached the limits of the rig, the casing, and everything else. So future wells will look to go deeper than that. And the key point then comes down to, okay, where are you guys at in this? Because a lot of the feeling is, great, you've drilled one well, come back to us when you've got another 11 into the play and maybe we'll be interested. There are a lot of wells in this area. So the key things that we need here are the reservoir rock, how much of it have we got, what's our understanding of that, the overpressure gas, how pervasive is that and can you prove it, and the final thing is where are you at on understanding the commerciality of the flow. So the first one, reservoir. There are more than 900 wells drilled in the Thrace Basin, so we have penetrations of this reservoir everywhere and we understand the system very well. The reservoir rock we're targeting is about between 2,000 and 3,000 meters thick. So in the Yamlik well, we only drilled half of it. There's still up to another 1,000 to 1,500 meters of potential reservoir ahead of us. So it's very well understood. The second point is, okay, you got the high pressure gas there, but where is that gas? And showing on this, this map, the red dots are all the wells that had very high pressure gas in the deeper sections. The blue ones are the ones that drilled very deep. And some of these wells up to 4,700 meters, they were drilled deep. But the pressure remained normal. So we believe that somewhere in between there is a boundary. But just saying it is not just Yamluk where we've drilled, but we really have that basin surrounded and proving that there's high pressure gas there. We've had the comment from people, why don't you drill in the center of the basin? We don't feel we need to at this point, um, if you understand kind of the dynam dynamics of it. If you have the hydrostatic, the normally pressured rock around the fringe, and then you have that high pressured rock as a donut around the edge, the, the pressure can't get out of the center. We do believe it's very likely that it's in there. At some point it will be drilled, but again, going deep, you don't expect that's where you're gonna find your best reservoir quality. So when we drilled the well, and we saw the logs. Uh, the first thing we did was call DNM, who are our reserves auditor, and get them in to start working on working prospective resource report up. Um, there wasn't the interest yet in the company, but we knew what we had, and Statoil knew what we had in this. So we got them in. So very quickly after we were in testing, they were able to conclude their work after they'd viewed all the test data that we had from the well. So that you can see there is still a very large range on Valura's interest in this, from three TCF up to 20 TCF of gas, and I believe that an uncertainty in that range that exists is real. Um, the mean they have there is 10, and then when you risk that at about 50% chance of success, again, DNM numbers, you come out with just over five TCF of gas for us. Now what's included in that is just that reservoir section, it's kind of in here, which is that, we'll call it the Keshan or the Tess McCoy section. They haven't included the shallow stratigraphy, and they only go to the depth of the well. Our appraisal wells will be going to 5,000 meters, and we're gonna look at another probably 1,000 meters of potential reservoir deeper than us that could be moved in here. As well as, as we move deeper with the appraisal well, we'll be able to look at that shallower section as well and see whether that's potential reservoir. So there is still further upside that can be brought into this play, but more important as we go into this appraisal is really getting it to line of sight towards commerciality. So we have the money in place to do this. We have the program agreed with our partner, Statoil, to go forward. Uh, we're just in the procurement phase and we expect to get going fairly soon. But the objectives of that appraisal program are one, the gas in place numbers are massive and it's about proving to everyone. We've seen the high pressure gas in the wells all around and we're quite confident, but it's drilling wells like Yamluk that are acquiring a lot of core, that are acquiring uh, the latest quality of you know, wireline logging and that data set that really proves that the gas is present in place. We'll also look, as I said, at the shallower stratigraphy as well as drilling deep. Now, it's not necessary that all wells will drill down to 5,000 meters, um, but one of them will likely just to try and find that reservoir floor. And more importantly for us is demonstrating that that flow is commercial. Um, the tests that we did on Yamluk were very short of only one or two days. They were really more designed with the equipment we had in that there to see if we flowed gas to surface and recover samples. 
we were surprised by the energy level that existed there and how uh, it came on. But we really want to see now how is that going to perform on long-term testing. And this is the area, we don't have any negative evidence as to how that will perform, but we don't have sufficient evidence to generate that type curve, which is what everyone wants to see. Great discovery, nice test. Can you send me your type curve and your locations? I want to be able to run economics. We're not at that point. And this is the uncertainty that we will really work to minimize as we go forward in the program. So we'll go back to Yamalik um, in July is our plan right now. The correct test equipment is being taken from North America over to Turkey. It's on the boat and should be arriving there shortly to be ready to go back to that well, drill out all the plugs, put tubing in the well, flow that well, and production log it too to understand more where we think most of the flow is coming, get better understanding. And again, the pipeline has already been constructed to the site because we'll just tie this right into our facilities and we should even be sending the gas to customers in July. We will then go back out on a three-well program, and these will be drilled back-to-back. -back. We expect to start in late Q3, possibly as early as August, with that drilling program to drill these three wells, which will be spread around the basin to prove that that uh, gas is present right across the basin. And that will be followed by a fracking and testing program. And successful wells will be again tied in immediately so that we generate that revenue. So we're all set up for that program. We're fully funded. Um, we have it agreed with our partner, Equinor Stat Oil. We're going over there next week, in fact, to have another week of technical meetings with them to get ready going into this program. And while we don't have type curves and generate value, what I've tried to do is really show an indication of how would the economics that you get in Turkey compare to what you get in Texas and Alberta. And what I'm just showing here, it's a horizontal well. It's going to recover just under 8 BCF equivalent a day. I think it's got a condensate ratio of about 30 barrels per million scuff. And it assumes full tax paying in each one of those jurisdictions, so no, no other benefit. But what really drives here, because fiscal terms are quite similar, you're seeing that they get, we get much higher gas prices, and that's what really drives the higher value. So if we are able to achieve a type curve like you see over here, much better value coming out of the Turkish operation. But as you look forward at what's the probability that you're going to have a commercial project in a type curve, then you say, I can take an extremely poor result of a well in North America and still generate very good returns in Turkey. And that's really what we're asking to consider is that probability. And the last thing just to show on value is just showing we can work out an implied value of this project just looking at our market cap, um, looking at the acres that DNM, net acres that DNM have given to us. And it comes out to you've got about 2,500 US per acre. And what's plotted on there is from GMP, all of the actual deals done in the US in the past, um, past 10 or 15 years, a lot of oil, high oil price, low oil price, high gas price, low gas price. It's all of them. You can actually work that data set to change it, but it's just showing it where our value is now as a potential acquisition target. How am I doing, Keith? A couple minutes to just conclude? Good. So really, that S-curve, it's not really the value of the asset, but it's what you guys as shareholders are used to. Where you tend to make a lot of value is in that early expiration phase when you can get multiples. Once you take FID, Normally, there's quite a quiet period there as these things are developed. We believe there's still that value bump there because of the size of this project and the potential in it, give it line of sight towards commerciality. And we've got the program that's set up, fully funded and ready to go over the next month or two. It'll be starting to deliver on that. So thank you very much for your time this morning. I look forward to talking to you as the day progresses. We were. All the gas that we produce around this. Sorry, could you repeat the question? Yes. I'll, I'll repeat, that, repeat that. So the question was about, I haven't mentioned condensate, um, but all the gas that is produced in the Thrace has generally been very low. It's, in fact, it's dry. We dehydrate the gas. It comes right out of the wellhead, dehydrate, send it right onto our customers. What surprised us here was the level of condensate down in the deep basin. And it does kind of change in the deep, and it is uncertain as to how much is there. But the highest rates we saw on the bottom were about 70 
um, barrels per standard cubic feet. And as you moved up shallower, it seemed to be a bit lower, but the testing was not as good. It's something we still have to refine as we go through the program, but we think the condensate value here will be huge. You do get Brent pricing, uh, sometimes more towards Saudi pricing in Turkey. Yeah, what's interesting, this is, it's all a continuous turbidite package that's here, that mass of thickness in the basin, so it's a bit surprising. All of our measurements, we've done, you know, all the coring, everything is in the sands, and that's what we've evaluated and that's what we've fracked. We have not looked at the shales yet in that. So the processes we're seeing, on average in the shallowest part, so 3,000, 3,300, about, um, let's say, 8, 9%. And right at the bottom at 42, the average would be between 3 and 4 percent, and it is declining through that round. What we have seen, though, from the core and the FMI logs is all of the shales in this section are actually thinly laminated sands. So while it's not included in the numbers that we have for gas, I expect that you're going to see those contribute as you get into production for this, of more gas coming out of those shales as well. In this play, uh, I think that will be in what we'll call an early production project. So you're looking at probably late 19, 2020, when we go through that design of, um, do, you know, as to how to go about an early production project. It's very interesting. We're still analyzing whether this is a vertical or whether it's a horizontal development. Um, with so much gas over such a long interval, you think vertical. But I think what will probably happen is, given the higher porosity in that in the shallow zone, you're going to try and hit those with horizontals initially uh, to get the best returns, and then the project will develop to look for the deeper stuff in future. Okay. Thank you very much, guys.